I had the honor of serving in the United States Army, the Army National Guard, and the U.S. Army Reserve from 1990 to 2013. During that time, I got to carry a rucksack with some of the finest that America has to offer. From my first assignment as an infantryman in Alaska's uh, Charlie Company 4-9 Infantry, a Manchu for those of you who are in the know, to my last assignment as the Command Sergeant Major of the 172nd MMB, I stood shoulder to shoulder with people who enrich our communities throughout our state and nation and live values like loyalty, duty, honor, and personal courage. I, to say that I'm proud to have served in the Army is an understatement, but it would be equally understated to say that I'm simply proud to have served shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with these wonderful people. 2.8 million service members have deployed to the Middle East 5.5 million times since 9-11. There has been no draft to fill the ranks. With the exception of three or four senior leaders who were drafted for service into Vietnam, this, these wars of our generation have been manned entirely by volunteers. In addition to the old people like me who had been around long before 9-11, hundreds of thousands of young Americans raised their hand to volunteer for service with the almost certain knowledge that they would be deploying to combat in the Middle East. This generation is uncommonly special in my opinion, the first to shoulder the burdens of a global war entirely voluntarily. It is a wonderful generation of people. You know them. We've got some in the room, and they have made a tremendous sacrifice on behalf of our country in the past 20 years. On the battlefields in our recent history, the enemy does not wear a uniform. Uncertainty is the only constant. People are forced into all kinds of tough and uh, gray areas where decisions are made in an instant that have an impact that lasts a lifetime. I know how hard it is to make friends with another culture while looking at them, looking at them through the sights of my rifle. I have tasted the fear of knowing that at any second, that gunner and that driver that I love, like my own flesh and blood and I, will be blasted into debris along with our hillbilly armored Humvee on the side of the road. It's a taste that lingers in your in your mouth for a long time. I've had the sear of guilt that comes with not engaging a suspicious vehicle in the dark of the night that later took numerous American lives as sharply as I felt the sear of relief that comes with not pulling the trigger on an ally that looked just like my enemy. While I was overseas, I didn't just miss my daughter's birthday or first day of school or Christmas. I missed my son's birth entirely. My captain on that same mission, Dan Decker, had a daughter about a week before we left for 15 months and didn't get to meet his daughter until she was a toddler. What about the sacrifice of my wife, Brooke, or Captain Decker's wife, Sarah? They're the heroes, I say. The impact of this generation on military families is a whole different story for another TED Talk. But suffice it to say, they know they've tasted the fear of a loved one not coming back, and it's fear that a taste that lingers for a long time. They've made, they've made the sacrifice of placing their family's needs behind the needs of the Army and our country. Many of these people, many of these families and soldiers have done this again and again and over and over. And most, a common leader in this generation didn't just deploy once or twice. Many of them spent many years overseas in combat, and they still do. The operations tempo began to be so rapid in this time that uh, the force was stretched extremely thin. Among our generation of service members, suicide has become a far too casual companion. Uh, a 2017 survey of Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans revealed that over 50% of them personally knew, personally had served with a fellow post 9-11 veteran who committed suicide. Already, veteran suicide rates compared to the, uh, to the general population were higher, but as the operations tempo increased in the mid-2000s, an alarming trend of an in a significant increase of suicide rates among younger veterans, those aged 18 to 36, startled the military into action. And the response of the Army was quick. It was high-quality suicide prevention training for all unit leaderships, things like ASSIST and drilling Ask Care Escort, the simple acronym ACE, into the heads of every new enlistee and every soldier in the Army. There were a couple of cultural 
challenges that the Army or any institution as large as that with a long tradition has to overcome. And the first is the perception of the stigma that is attached to those who seek uh, mental health resources, especially leaders. For right or wrong, the Army is an extremely, extremely competitive environment. Uh, a perceived weakness, such as seeking mental health treatment, is something that leaders have a tendency to try to avoid. Promotion and assignment uh, opportunities are extremely important. I'm sure that I wasn't the only leader who packed my issues deep down inside of this rucksack where they wouldn't see the light of day, where they wouldn't have an opportunity to make me not mission ready or non-deployable. That errant viewpoint, for lack of a better term, is something that I suspect I had in common with my colleagues, although they weren't going to say much about it. I'm sure that I'm not the only one to, to have to deal with uh, a struggle while maintaining that positive face in the public leadership. The command, the official command um, message from the Army, however resistant we were to seek that help was, there is help for everybody, including leaders. It was highly encouraged for everybody to get help and the resources were there. But the other hurdle I think that the, uh, the military has is the typical confident self-reliance that many people who are drawn to it and certainly those who remain in it seem to have. I came from an army, a generation of the army with a long history, a rich tradition where soldiers were expected to pull themselves up by their bootstraps to finish the march whether you had crippling blisters or not. A first sergeant was expected to be able to stand in a pouring rain and pretend like he wasn't getting wet, that he was impervious to the effects. The same can go for a mortar attack or whatever that you can be impervious to the effects of. It motivates people. I relished my opportunity to stand in the rain and pretend that I wasn't getting wet as well. But like all those other first sergeants that came before me, I was getting drenched to the bone and I had a smile on my face the whole time. We get too good in the army at developing that facade and hiding anything that might show a crack in your armor or expose vulnerability. Institutions like the Army take a long time to change. The Army provided me with opportunities to do some amazing things to develop as an individual and as a leader, to do things that were of value, but the Army also exposed me to hardship and misery. Not too long ago, last spring, I wrote a poem, infantryman uh, writing poem, same like infantrymen wearing nylons underneath their uh, socks when they're doing long road marches to prevent blisters, right? I had this poem that was bubbling inside of me. You know, it felt, like, uh, it felt like the Keurig in the morning right before the liquid blasts through and pours into your cup. It had to have come out. And I, and I wrote this poem about the last mission that I did for the Army. And the last mission I did for the Army was called Casualty Escort Duty. I got to bring a fallen soldier home. And I'm going to share this poem with you today in the light of my understanding as I've worked uh, these years to be uh, as good as I can be, that leaders who expose vulnerability are probably more effective. Leaders who are open and transparent about issues, even those terrible issues like emotions, are more powerful. And for that reason, and as a tribute to the 7,000 others who come before me and have performed casualty escort duty since 9-11, I'm going to share it with you. And also as a tribute to those families that are left behind from the precious cargo that each of those escorts brought back to their homes. This poem is entitled Dover. I flew to Dover to bring Top home when his tour ended early. It was an unexpected tasking by division on that morning in July, in July a mission that required more courage than storming through Baghdad or Fallujah. It was no weapon or body armor to protect an assault. Just shielding for my heart required. A burden of leadership it was, my burden to bear, no way I would delegate it, an honor and a curse. 22 a day, the researchers claim. 22 veterans each day slip by death's clutch in foreign sands, yet end their lives with their own hands. A burden of leadership it was for Top in his overseas post, a burden weighted by our expectation of excellence and his self-imposed demand for perfection. Unattainable, of course, 
but a common pressure among leaders in professions of life and death. I was stunned by the call, a, a hasty and final solution to a temporary predicament in a land so foreign to us that most of us will never truly understand it. Top was number 22 that day his mission ended. I flew to Dover and inspected his uniform, a task I've done a thousand times, but never with the precision and attention that I mustered that day. Ribbons, perfect. Brass, polished. Creases, sharp. He was a picture of pride in perfect blues, if only his suit was gazed upon. A close but spiritless, spiritless resemblance of my friend when I let my gaze fall upon his face. Exceptional work by morticians at Dover. So skilled in making the fallen appear ready for a parade after 6,000 miles of rough travel. A committed cadre, expert through repetition, too many thousand times execute, executing their solemn duty with decorum and precision. A burden of leadership it is for the United States casualty team to become the world-class elite in preparing Americans for their last trip home. Inspection and complete and signatures penned. The casket was sealed. He will not leave my sight and my side until the roses are tossed into the ground as taps echoes off the hillside above his grave. Three seconds up goes the salute with my right hand as top is loaded into the jet by the honored guard of airmen. Steal your heart. If tears flow now, they may never stop. Your mission, steal your heart. Three seconds down goes my right hand, my left gently holding Top's widow. Be compassionate, heart. Her legs buckle from the crushing load of grief as he is ceremoniously transferred to the plane. Be compassionate, heart. Slicing through the air on a Kaleida air jet, just room for the two in the cockpit, the two in the jump seats, and one tightly sealed crate of precious cargo, draped proudly in the stars and stripes. Focus on the clouds, the instrument panel, the duty, steal your heart. Do not ponder the heartache or the tragedy, steal your heart. Sobs to my right, wrenching grief for a little girl and a young man who will never see dad again. For the loss of a husband, for the unanswered question, be compassionate heart, hold her hand. Console her soul, but guard yours, be compassionate. Turbulent mountain updrafts as the jet descends into the valley where Top's journey ends. The airfield is in sight. Hundreds of soldiers on the tarmac waiting, preparing for their part in this tragic do uh, detail, yearning to be at their sharpest for a first sergeant who was the essence of sharp. Beyond those ranks gleamed a hundred motorcycles, riders to protect Top, one on the last leg of his final journey. Leather-clad guardians who prevent clashes and protests on behalf of a mostly grateful nation and in support of a completely sorrowful family. What does it say about our country's unity when such a group as the Patriot Riders has a need to exist? Silence now as the jet aims for the asphalt in final approach and throttles back to glide, just the whistling of the wind to cover the pounding in my heart, the sniffles from the heartbroken lady whose hand I grasp tightly. For him, I encourage, you must muster up all you have left inside when this hatch opens. Stand tall, ma'am, find fortitude, steal your heart. Fortitude she found, her resolve inspiring, solid, like warm steel. Sultry summer sun and sudden rush of light as the jet is open. Family joins her quickly, my compassion shifted like a baton in a relay race, easier now to be unemotional, but guiltily relieved. Three seconds up as top is carried out by the honor guard, my soldiers this time, crisp, precise, somber and tall, proud to shoulder the duty to be chosen, their honor. Three seconds down as top passes, luck passes salutes that shield 300 pairs of glossy eyes in a formation of tribute. Into the Cadillac we go, top and I. The thunder of Harley tailpipes lead the charge as headlights string along behind us on the interstate gawking cars speeding by the convoy, the occasional hand over the heart, the infrequent salute and nod, the realization that they're passing by a fallen soldier. The funeral site is in home now, and the realization that the next few hours would be the most difficult of this mission, visitation. The key to the casket, carefully carried from Dover, 
deftly used by the director, the toil of a Dover mortician exposed for him to assess and admire. Impressive work if analyzed by a mortician eyes. A last private moment with Top before the doors opened to the family. One last inspection, my friend. Flecks of makeup on the uniform, stubborn, but removed with pinches carefully from pinches of fingers that felt detached from my body. Ribbons, perfect. Brass, polished. Creases, sharp. And a coin that says, from the command sergeant major, for excellence, placed near his right hand in the coffin, for excellence. And I meant it. Grieving family members come in slowly, carefully, as I stand at top's feet at parade rest, my head and eyes fixed in on, a wall, on a light switch across the wall from them. Two hours of remaining vigilant, rigid, rigid under the pouring, compressed sorrow that was in that room that afternoon. Tears risk breaking from containment as I watch Top's daughter grasp for one last touch of dad through the corner of my eye, the very moment of a child's heart fracturing steelier heart. Only one person left now to say goodbye, and that was his partner in all things except this last journey that he would make. Weariness and sorrow overtook her as she sat at his side together for one last while. A deliberate suspension of my duty I made as I walked from that room, be compassionate heart. They had some things to work out, she and Top did, and I pray they did. Friends, families, soldiers, and dignitaries showed their true appreciation for a warrior, a family man, a friend, while the honor guard performed its duties with distinction in the great hall and at the graveside. 21 gun shoots signaled the conclusion of my duty while taps echoed in around along the cliffs guarding the ceremony, the notes fading away with the end of my mission and the end of tops. Be compassionate, heart. Let yourself weep for your friend, for those shattered lives, for the pain stuffed deep where the light of thought can't touch it. You're forever a soldier, and a heart of steel helps you survive the profession of life and death. Be compassionate, heart. You will ever, forever carry a soldier's armor Yet vulnerability makes you flourish in the pursuit of living. Coldness is uncomplicated. Warmth requires discipline. Although it has been years now since that last burden of leadership that, ship that the Army placed upon me, that I placed upon myself, my heart's armor has been slow to peel. I hope that one day I can unshield it easily as I did before, before I went to Dover. I'm sure I'm not the only veteran who's found myself feeling all alone on the long hike with my rucksack since I left the service. I miss the team. I miss the mission. Most of all, I think frequently about those uncommonly excellent soldiers that I've carried with a pack, that I've carried a pack with, that I've had the honor to serve with. I know these individuals easily would reach out their hand to anybody in need. They're high quality people. Where they struggle though, is extending a hand when they need it. As I prepared for TEDx Hieronymus Park, I thought about picking up my ruck. I feel it bubbling inside me like the Keurig before the coffee pours out. I need to put, pick up my ruck, and I need to team with those amazing leaders um, that I've had the honor of serving with in the past. So I will be calling upon these people. We've got them sprinkled throughout communities in our country. Excellent, dedicated, caring individuals who have sacrificed a tremendous deal, not only of themselves, but also of their family. These people would be happy to get together and create a network where we can reach out to fellow veterans. We can capitalize on that experience of carrying a ruck that they did so well. We can call it something like, keep on rucking Montana. There are 100,000 veterans in Montana. Or ruck on America. There are 22 million veterans in the United States. Together, supporters and veterans, there's no reason to think that we can't make the first goal of mar uh, marching together, shoulder to shoulder, a million miles. And from there, who knows how much it'll, it'll grow. We've got an amazing group right here in Hamilton, Montana, of veterans and supporters, and that's where it'll start. If you're gonna get to a million mile, it starts with one step. I think that we can team together, and all of us together can keep on rucking in the free world. 
I sure intend to. Thank you and keep up the fire.